How's it going? Welcome back to my medieval restaurant. How's it going? How are you? Oh my gosh, it's been so long. I've missed you. Today we're going to be talking about hard work, winter recommendations. I have a bunch of books that I want to recommend you to read during the cold wintry season. Can I be honest with you? Can I be vulnerable? I don't really like winter that much. It's not like not my favorite season. I live in Canada where it gets as low as minus 40. So it gets really cold. What I do like is a book set in winter or that has like a wintry vibe, okay? I like the aesthetic, the feeling of winter more than actually being in the winter. There's one Christmas book here because I meant to film this before Christmas and release it before Christmas. And then um, depression really kicked in like to high gear. So I didn't <laughs> just pretend that Christmas reads are still like applicable, okay? Also, don't forget to hit subscribe. Don't forget to I don't know, like and share or whatever. <laughs> also, don't forget to check out my Patreon where we have a bunch of different things, extra content, reading vlogs, reading sprints, discussions. Just confirmed that we're gonna have St. Gibson of Dowry of Blood fame on the Patreon in March after her new book, An Education of Malice, comes out. We're gonna have her on the Patreon and she's gonna talk to us about about her book, about her little, about her little lovely, beautiful life. And maybe not her life, cause that's kind of weird, but like we're gonna talk to her in detail about everything. Check out the Patreon. There's a bunch of stuff always happening on Patreon. It's a lot of fun. We just had Gavin on. That was a, that was a hoot and a holler. Okay, it's a hoot and a holler. Uh, oh, also don't forget to follow me on Instagram. Forgot to mention that also in case you just wanted to do it. <laughs> just out of the crazy, crazy kindness of your heart. First things first, we gotta start with maybe one of my favorite books of all time. Like I loved this book so much. It was actually crazy how much I loved it. And it's set in like the snowy mountains. I think it's like set in like Appalachia. Is that how you say it? Appalachia? <laughs> Appalachia? Whatever, like those mountains that are creepy and crawly that have like skin walkers and shit. I'm talking about Near the Bone by Christina Henry. I feel, and this is just my opinion, Christina Henry's books are like a lot of like hit and misses. You know what I mean? This a hit. It was, cra it was crazy how good this is. If you haven't read it, let me tell you what it's about, okay? It's about this girl, her name is Maddie, M-A-T-T-I-E, right? She's like a normal, regular, regular, everyday, average kind of bitch. And she is living out in the mountains with her husband. They're like settlers, but it's like 2018 or something like that. They live in this like teeny tiny little little cabin in the middle of fuck nowhere. And these snowy little Alps. Is the Appalachia Alps? No. They're living there. Uh, the only thing, and like, listen, it's secluded, it's isolated, and that's not really like a problem for normal people who have normal marriages, but for Maddie, it's a bit of a problem because her husband is abusive and like an actual demon person, like not an actual demon person, but he's like evil, just in the sense that he's very violent and like gross and like predatory and just like the, he's just the worst. He's just, he's just the worst, okay? Trust me, Maddie and her husband, whose name I literally don't remember, William, ew, let's call him Bill. Bill and Maddie are living in the mountains. Maddie's not having a great time. It's not the time of her life because she's being abused by William, by Bill. By Billy Bob. One day, Maddie finds a fox carcass, like a fox corpse. And it's like being mutilated, like in weird ways that, like ways that you don't normally see in nature. This fox looks fucked up and looks weird. Okay, it looks, it looks freaky dicky. Maddie sees it and she's like, oh, there's something weird going on. There's something else in those woods that's not me or William or some other like random animal, like something else is going on. And then to make things worse, these three random people show up on their little mountain and they're like, hey, we're looking for this like, mythical monster thing here in your woods. Maddie and her husband, Billy Bob, are like, this is not great. These dudes are awful. It says Maddie knows their presence will anger William. Terrible things will happen. And terrible things happen when William is angry. Bro, when I tell you that this book actually like creeped me out, like actually kind of scared me a little bit. You have like all of these different points of contention, of conflict, not only with like this presence of this thing that's in the, the woods, in the snow, in the forest, in the, like in the mountains or whatever, but then you also have like fucking Billy Bob, 
and his crazy ass and how fucking scary that guy is and then you have like these like three strangers who are just like fucking around and finding out basically and then you have maddie who's just like this like very meek very small very like closed off very like shrunken character who you just like are just like come on like get it like come on bro you need to like you need to open up you know what i mean you need to like get in there it's just so good there, there's so much tension there's so much like fear also the fact that it's set in this like snowy desolate secluded isolated area where like there's they're like miles within help within anyone else it's so good 10 out of 10 this is the thing where i'm like if you want to read like a wintry kind of book this is the this is the one bro in my opinion i loved it this next book is kind of crazy because for me to recommend you this book i have to recommend you the whole series because uh it's the second book in a series but hear me out, okay? Hear me out. I'm talking about the Small Spaces Quartet by Katherine Arden. We have Small Spaces, the first one. Dead Voices, which is the one that I'm recommending. Dark Waters, Empty Smiles. Look at that cover, dude. These covers are crazy. They're so good. These are middle grade horror novels. I have read the first two. I actually think that there was a fifth one released recently. This is the one that I'm recommending, but just generally I'd recommend all of them. But the second one is set at this, again, secluded, wintry, blizzardy, uh, like cabin place and they're kind of like stuck there and then there's like all these ghosty and ghouly things so in this series we're following ollie and her two friends ollie in the first book it's just like a regular girl whatever she's like walking along the street one day and she sees this woman in like a little pond such like river off to the side of the road just like crying into like this book and ollie being a normal well-adjusted kid <laughs> goes up to the woman uh, rather than like consoling her, asking what's wrong or if she can help, she just snatches the book from her and like runs off. You know, Ollie, <laughs> Ollie's a bit crazy, okay? So she takes this book and she starts reading it and she's like, this shit's freaky deaky, this shit's weird. She finds out that it's about this like farm where like this girl had these two dudes who were like really into her, but she goes to this like smiling man who can make your wishes come true. And it says that the smiling man is this like sinister dude who grants your most tightly held wish, but only for the ultimate price. The next day, Ollie is on the bus. They're going to this like factory thingy, this like farm. I'm not sure. They're going somewhere on like a little school trip. So she's reading this book and she's like, this is like hot and steamy and crazy. Maybe not hot and steamy, but it's like crazy. Um, and then they get there and then she realizes that the woman who she stole the book from is like the owner of this uh, like farm or factory that they're visiting. And she's like, well, that's awkward. I literally like <laughs> uh, stole your shit, but whatever. And she also realizes that the graves of the people that she's reading about in this book are like literally on this land. There's like tombstones and shit. She's like, oh my God, that's like the same people. It's like the girl and like those two guys. What's even more weird is like on the way home, the bus breaks down. And so Ollie and everyone is like freaking out. A bunch of kids on a school bus, the bus breaks down. The teacher's like, I'll figure it out. Not only that, but the bus driver is like, hey kids, y'all better watch your backs cause something's coming for you. And they're like, okay, we're like literally 12. Can you chill? Like what the fuck? And then what's even more creepy and weird is like Ollie looks down at her little wrist watch. She's got like a little wrist watch. And it says, I'm assuming it's like one of those like digital watches. And it says run. So Ollie gets the fuck out of Dodge. She gets the fuck out of there. And she heads back to the little farm factory thing. As night descends, the scarecrows in the surrounding fields seem to close in watching them. Ollie thinks the watch might be right. And then she's joined by her two classmates and they, they're they stuck seemingly in this world trapped by the smiling man. It's so genuinely creepy, crawly, and is, oh my God, it's so good. Again, middle grade horror. It just does some of the creepiest shit. For horror novels meant for children, these books are genuinely so creepy and like kind of scary. I love this series. I've, again, I've only read the first two, but I loved them. I still need to read the other ones. I still need to get to them. I think I honestly might do like a reading vlog. Let's talk about a classic, okay? We have Misery by Stephen king listen tiffany i don't necessarily like live laugh love stephen king i'm not uh jizzing in the pants at the opportunity to read his stuff specifically like even just like his new stuff uh i don't think it's that good but what i will say is the old stuff the stuff where he was dependent 
on substances, I think is some of his best stuff. I'm not saying that Stephen King should do coke and shit. Like now it's like an older man, but it was, it was crazy. In case there's any chance that you have not read or seen this film, this book, let me tell you what it's about, okay? It's about this guy, his name is Shaw. His name is Paul Sheldon. He's a writer, he's like an author, and he has been writing these books about this character named Misery. I feel like they're the kind of books that are like drama, romance type of novels, you know what I mean? Like very much like mass market paperback, kind of like Harlequin maybe. And he is tired of it, he's sick of it. He wants to be Tom fucking Clancy, okay? He wants to be James fucking Patterson. So he's like, I'm done with this like feminine bullshit. I'm done with this like woman shit. I'm gonna start writing about like men and like cars and like detectives or whatever. He's about to submit his manuscript uh, to his editor. Like the last book where he has finally killed off misery and he's like he's and he's ending it he's letting it go you know it's the last book he's done with it he's like in his car driving it's snowy it's blizzardy there's fucking wind and it's like crazy he can't see anything in front of him and so he's like driving and then boom the car goes off of this like cliff basically it means i like rolling his car down the mountainside it's crazy and then tiffany he doesn't die he survives because the next thing he knows he wakes up and there's this bitch standing over him being like i'm your biggest fan i'm your biggest fan paul is like the fuck and he he is not in good shape he's not in good shape at all he's in horrible shape really this girl annie wilkes has saved his life she's like i pulled you out of your car and i dragged you i dragged you here and you're now at my house. The weather is horrible. The blizzard is horrible. You know, there's weather warnings and everything. The phones are down. And he's like, I also know that you're like Paul Sheldon, the author of like Misery. And he's like, yeah, that's me. I'm an author. Like, listen, the moment he sees Annie, he's kind of like suspicious of her. Annie's a bit weird. Listen, Annie's an icon, but she's a bit of a weirdo, you know? And so Paul is like, okay, cool, Annie. Thanks so much for the help. Like, maybe we could call a doctor. And she's like, can't. The phones are down. We can't get a hold of anyone. I'll just like care for you myself though. I'm a nurse. I used to be a nurse. Paul is basically stuck with Annie in this house with her because he has nowhere else to go. He can't walk. His legs are fucking broken or whatever. And Annie, as time goes on, becomes more and more obsessed, more and more agitated, more and more unstable. I did read this book and I, can I be honest with you? I actually kind of prefer the movie over the book. I feel like the movie makes Paul Sheldon much more likable versus this book. I feel like Paul in the book is an actual raging misogynist and I was actively really rooting for Annie. Being inside this motherfucker's mind was not good. Annie though, I was like, I get, I get the vision. I see where she's going with this. Like she's a woman who knows what she wants and she's gonna go after it. And so I was like, oh my God, my voice. I really loved her. And Paul, not so much, but this was still a fun experience. There's so many scenes that are just gruesome. Also, I did a reading vlog actually for this book on my Patreon. Um, so if you're interested, you can go check it out um, on the Patreon. Next up, I wanna talk about Beneath the Stairs by Jennifer Fawcett. This was, I think, one of my favorite books in 2022. But this is about this place called Summer Mills. Specifically, it's about this house in Summer Mills. It's kind of like on the outskirts of town. It's called the Octagon House. Many people don't even know that it's there. Less people have actually gone into that house because it's like abandoned. And it's also like cursed or like rumored to be cursed because people say that a man used to live there along with his wife and children and he ended up butchering his wife and children and burying them on the property. That's what people say. They say it's haunted. Our main character, Claire and Abby, her friend, go to the Octagon House as teenagers and Claire comes out of that house but Abby comes out of that house missing something that was years ago people move on people people change whatever and our main character Claire she's living in the big city whatever and she gets a phone call one day hey Claire uh hate to bother you we know that you're a big businesswoman in New York City or whatever um but we wanted to let you know that Abby um your friend who like uh, went into the house with you all those years ago, remember? Yeah. So she like tried to kill herself um, and she's like in a coma. So if you could just come to uh, Summer Mills again, 
we'd love to just like have you here and we're sure also that abby would really love it if you visited we want her to hear your voice you know what i mean so claire is like i haven't been back home in a while but i'm gonna go back for my friend and thus begins the story of a woman like reconciling her past but through the present this book i feel like is so good in terms of like atmosphere the writing is sensational the character development claire is a character i feel like she's not very likable but but then at the same time you don't really need to like her it's honestly almost better if you don't genuinely so creepy this house the idea of this house terrifies me speaking of books that i love i want to talk to you about night film by marisha pezzel i know that this book is like very controversial like a lot of people either like fucking hate this or they fucking love it and i'm in the cap of fucking love it i read this when it came out years ago years ago i read it in one sitting and it blew my mind also one of the most beautiful books i've ever seen look at that Excuse me while I catch my breath. That was crazy. If you don't know, Night Film by Marisha Pessel is about this dude. He's like a filmmaker. His name is Cordova, right? And he's like very prolific. He's like released, he's kind of like Alfred Hitchcock, but like for horror movies. He's renowned. Okay, but he's also like very mysterious. He's like an enigma. Enig en I can't say the word. <laughs> he's enigmatic. He releases a film, I think like in the 70s or the 80s, and then he literally like, goes off the map he's like off the radar nobody sees hears from him ever again people know that he exists but nobody knows what he looks like nobody knows anything about him really until his daughter ashley she like dies and people are like oh my god she killed herself it was suicide but there's this one journalist scott he's like this journalist or he used to be a journalist he still is a journalist i guess he was kind of like bullied off the internet really after he tried to like expose cordova for being like shady but then cordova literally like pulled like an uno reverse card type of shit and he literally got like laughed off the internet scott is like bitter beans okay this guy is drinking haterade every single goddamn day of his life he can't get away from it scott hears about ashley's death and he's like suicide i don't fucking think so that girl did not kill herself her father did this to her i'm sure of it scott starts going on this little journey this like mystery solving thing where he wants to prove what he couldn't prove all those years ago about cordova and this time he's not gonna fucking lose it this time he's actually gonna get to the bottom of the truth the truth the bottom of whatever he's gonna get to the bottom of it scott i don't really like him but everything else about this book is literally perfect and stunning. It's more plot motivated than it is character motivated. I'm gonna tell you that right now. So if you know that you don't like books that don't have like great character development, skip it. Don't read it. You're not gonna like it. But the plot, the mystery, the atmosphere of the novel, oh, it's, it's perfect. It's like an entire vibe. Also, these are the end papers. Look how beautiful that is. What I also really love about this book is that you'll have like multimedia pieces. So if a character is like looking at a web page, if the character is like looking at a note, at a receipt, blah, 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 you're also looking at that thing. Honestly, it's just a beautifully done book. I think the next time I do like the rereading my favorites kind of like reading vlog, I think I want to include this because it's a book I've been wanting to reread. And honestly, even if I reread it and hated it, I think I would still keep it because just this cover, just the abs like the way that it like does that reflection thing absolutely bends my mind. Let's talk about the Christmas novel, the whole <laughs> Christmas book, and that is Nosferatu by Joe Hill. Listen, it's been a while since I read this, and I honestly think that the first half of this book is way better than the second half. I think the first half is almost perfect. And then the second half is kind of, it kind of like loses itself a little bit, but it's still a great book to read during Christmas, during winter, because it's just so much fun. Also kind of creepy. Also the audiobook with Kate Mulgrew. <laughs> Nosferatu is about this girl named Vic McQueen right? Vic uh, has this thing where she can travel anywhere she wants when she's lost something. She's an uncanny knack for finding things. It's almost like magical, really. She'll like cross a bridge, this one specific bridge, and she'll end up in a completely different place and end up finding things that her mom lost, that she lost. Vic really has like a hard time at home. Her dad and her mom are constantly, constantly fighting. It's like a mess. It's kind of giving like trailer park vibes, but either way, 
She's a kid coming from like a broken home. And so she's like emotionally messed up. And we have this dude named Charles Manx. Charles has a gift of his own. Charles is basically like Santa Claus, but if Santa Claus was gross and like pedophilic and creepy, he takes children for rides in his 1938 Rolls Royce Wraith. In his car, he and his innocent guests can slip out of the everyday world to an astonishing playground of amusements he calls Christmas Land. Charles is taking these little kitties to Christmas Land and turning them into little, little creepy ass things, turning them into little dead things that have fish hook teeth. That's how it's described in the book. It has literally never left my mind. The moment I read or I heard fish hook teeth, that's, it's just lived right, right there, right in this little area, right there. One day, Vic crosses the bridge. She ends up in Christmas land. It's not good. Vic barely makes it out with her life, okay? Vic ends up being the only child to ever escape Charlie's little Christmas land. And then years later, realizes that Charlie Manx, creepy vampire dude, Nosferatu, still thinks about her, still knows about her, and wants to get back at her for what she did to Christmas land, to him. Beginning of this book is so good. The first half, impeccable. I think the second half, it gets a bit weird. It gets a bit convoluted, but either way, it's a great book for Christmas time for winter. Maybe read it this year, you know, in November. <laughs> Next up, let's talk about No Exit by Taylor Adams. I think I read this book in one sitting. I absolutely devoured it. It's so good. And like a lot of girlies on booktube, on like just like the book community in general, will tell you that this is like top-notch thriller. That This is the kind of book to sit down and to just sink your little teeth into. And honestly, when I read this book, I read it with like my window cracked open and I could feel like the cold winter air, cause it was winter, coming through the window and it really added to the atmosphere of this book. So let me tell you what this is about. This is about Darby. Darby is on the way to see her mom in Utah. Her mom is like dying. It's not great. She doesn't have like a great relationship with her family, but she's like, my mom's fucking croaking. Is that, is that inappropriate? <laughs> is that rude? Her mom is passing away slowly. Uh, so she has to go. She's driving, but it's like really, 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 really snowy. It's very scary on the roads, icy. There's snow everywhere. She can barely see in front of her, right? We've heard about this before. We've seen it before, but that's what's happening to Darby. Darby's like, I gotta get out of the storm. I'm gonna go just chill out in this like rest stop. So she pulls up, you know, she gets out of her car. She parks next to this like van. She goes in and there's like, I think like five other people in there. Everyone seems like friendly enough, whatever. But at one point she is desperate. So like call home to see if anything's new, if mom's passed yet. So she goes outside trying to look for signal. She's standing by her car. She sees the car next to hers, the van. And she sees that there's like a child in the van. So Darby is like, what the fuck is going on? And so Darby is like, Somebody in that fucking rest stop is literally like kidnapping fucking kids. Who is this Charlie Manx? She goes back in there being like, I'm gonna find out whose car it is. Maybe also try to figure out a way to get her to get her the fuck out of there. It's very much like a sort of a imposter among us mafia kind of vibe where you're like, who is it? Everybody has their like flaws, has like things where you're like, you're creepy in this way, you're creepy in that way. You know what I mean? The snow, the winter, the cold, the isolation. And that's, I think that's one of the things I love most about like winter thrillers slash horror is how much isolation and like desolation sort of comes into play with them. I think it's just such a beautiful mixture of like this cold freezing atmosphere with also just terror. Speaking of terror and isolation, I have Dead of Winter by Darcy Coates. I think I would also include Voices in the Snow for this as well, but whatever. I've mentioned this book so many times. I've also mentioned it, I think, in my best of horror for 2023. So I'm not gonna talk about it for too long. Basically, it's this girl, she's like stranded in the middle of Buffalo nowhere with a bunch of people that she doesn't know in a cabin, this tiny little cabin with like eight other people. And not only that, but like somebody in their group is like killing, killing people. Everybody has to figure out who it is. And it's just, it's a book of suspense, of paranoia. Not only that, but like the whodunit, the like absolute mystery had me fucked up. And it's so good. It's also kind of gory. It's kind of, it's very creepy. I loved it. It's like, it's very much fast paced. And it's also giving again, that thing of like cold, terrifying, isolated, desolation, 
kind of vibe. Another book kind of got the isolation factor and that is The Hunting Party by Lucy Foley. I think this is my favorite of her books. This was the first book I've read from her and I absolutely loved, loved it. This is basically about a school reunion. It's held in like the Scottish wilderness and it's like very fancy like resort thing but then it ends up like snowing everyone gets snowed in so everybody's like literally trapped there and then oh somebody's literally literally murdered murdered and it's one of the people who attended the reunion it says the beautiful one the golden couple the volatile one the new parents the quiet one the city boy and the outsider one of these friends is a murderer and one won't make it out alive it's very much giving the vibes of the other books i've mentioned so far it's also these complicated interpersonal relationships between these people that are like very much fake. You know, like those kinds of books that are about like fake people being fake and then they get called out for being fake and everyone's just super, super, super fake. That's like, <laughs> that's the vibe. It has that vibe, which I honestly kind of love sometimes. These people are awful. They're terrible. Nobody is good, but I live, laugh, love this book. Next up, let's talk about Let Me In by John Adjvide Lindvist. I'm gonna be honest with you, Tiffany. I'm gonna be honest with you. I have not read this book, <laughs> but I saw the cover. It looked snowy, it looked wintry. And so I'm gonna recommend it to you also because I know that people fucking love this book so much. And I've also had people for years telling me that I need to read it and I, I want to. I'm going to eventually read it, but I haven't read it. So this is about a young boy. I think he's like 12-ish. In his little town, there has been a body that's been discovered. The body of a teenage boy that has been drained of all of his blood, which is like freaky deaky. It's like weird. And people are kind of like shooken up about it. But our main character is like, hell yeah, good, good. Because he's hoping that his bullies will also get their blood drained and like die. That's kind of like what he's hoping for. But then also at the same time, there's this girl that's moved in next door to him, like who's around his age. And so they become friends, like fast friends. And he's also like bewildered by her because there's like a bunch of weird details about her that like don't make sense. Like she's never seen a Rubik's cube before, which he thinks is weird. Cause who hasn't heard of a Rubik's cube before? Like everybody knows what a Rubik's cube is. They become friends and then they also become perhaps more, maybe like they become like little, like, you know, preteen girlfriend, boyfriend situation. But it says there is something wrong with her, something odd. And she only comes out at night. So years ago, I watched the movie, which is based on the book. I think I watched the, did I watch the, did I watch the Swedish for, was it Swedish? For, I watched the, the version with the subtitles, I think. Either way, I remember liking the movie. I haven't seen it in ages, but I would be interested in reading the book. Also, it's a chonker. It's a big boy. Speaking of books I haven't read, <laughs> but do have seemingly a winter vibe, and that is The Captive by Fiona King Foster. I have not read this, but there's a girl, a child seemingly, maybe a woman on the cover in snow with a little snowy cabin, little snowy trees, little snow snow. This is about Brooke. Brooke lives in the middle of Buffalo nowhere with her family, with her husband and her two daughters, right? And they're happy, they're fine. They live out in the boonies, whatever. And then one day, Brooke's past comes to, comes to visit. This dude, his name is Stephen Colley. He's like released from prison or he like breaks out of prison, something like that. Stephen has like a grudge against Brooke. He like doesn't like Brooke at all. Like probably for like a reason, probably because I think she like put him behind bars or something like that. So he doesn't like Brooke. Stephen decides, you know what? I mean, let me pay a visit to my friend Brooke. So he goes to, you know, Brooke's little homestead. Being like, hey Brooke, you know, Brooke with all of this happening is like, okay, my husband, I think his name is Milo and her kids, she's like, we gotta get the fuck out of here. And so they end up actually like going on foot in the snow, in the cold, trying to find help. As Brooke's ghosts, both real and imagined, close in the ruthlessness that helped her survive her past may become the bigger threat to her hopes for a different future. It sounds so good because it's like, She's traveling with her family, shit's, f shit's strained. You know what I mean? I'm assuming that she's like a complicated relationship with her husband, but then also she has like a serial killer dude tracking her down, trying to kill her for what she did like years ago. Not only that, but then she has like her past decisions that she's like 
just living with and has to like, you know, reclaim, I suppose. It sounds really, really good. I haven't read it, but again, it had, it had snow on the cover and I own it. So I figured I should mention it. Let me know also in the comments if you've read this or if you've also read let me in what you thought of these uh because i'd love to know because I, I don't know maybe maybe i'll read them this winter let's talk about boys in the valley by frank for cassie this is about this like orphanage kind of place in the middle of nowhere and it's got like these kids they're overseen by these like religious dudes like these priests and it's like very 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 strict like very strict like these kids if they misbehave they're not allowed to eat not only that but like if they really misbehave they, they they get put into basically like a hole in the ground with like a little door on the top of it so they can't get out and they have to stay in that hole for the entire night even during like the winter during the cold ass winter night, these kids are like left in a hole. Things are kind of strained in the orphanage. The kids are obviously being abused and things aren't things aren't great for the kids. And then one day this this dude shows up. I think he's like the police chief or something like that. And he's like, hey priests, can you guys help me? Um, my brother has been a bit weird lately. And he brings in his brother and his brother's like, Ugh. his brother like is possessed by a demon. And so the priests are like, okay, this is fucked up. Why the fuck you bring this guy here? And they're like, well, you guys are priests, you know? And I don't think he's like sick sick. I think he's like sick with like the devil. The priests and stuff, they do their magic. Maybe not magic. They do like exorcisms and shit. And they end up killing this guy. The demon goes into the body of one of the children. It's kind of like, a coup <laughs> it's like a demonic coup of these kids now i do like this book i did think it was okay i think i gave it three stars the only thing i don't like about it is the ending it was giving like save yourself to jesus kind of moment it was kind of like like god is our savior that kind of thing which i didn't like because it seemed kind of preachy at the end where like the it seemed like philic philic it seemed like philip for cassie for cassie was like what if you loved jesus I didn't want to. So it was a bit weird at the end. It is a fast paced book. It's creepy. There's like a lot of like creepy kid shit going on, which if, you, if that's your thing, check it out. My friends, my family, my familia. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you so much for being here today. It's been so much fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know down below if you agree with these picks. If you have any other like winter horror recommendations, I'd love to know. Again, I'm constantly looking for more things to read, more things to buy. So let me know if you have any recommendations. I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget also to hit subscribe because we talk about spooky shit. We talk about creepy shit. We talk about there being no exit and night film and shit. Thank you so much. I hope you have a wonderful day. I will see you in my next video, okay? Have a good one. Stay gorgeous. You're literally fucking stunning. And I know I tell you all the time and I know you don't believe me, but believe it, bitch, because it's true. Okay, bye. <laughs> see you later. Bye.